All right, everyone, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think we'll see a few more people trickle in, but I want to welcome you on behalf of the Y. My name is Jana Smith, and I help support our community health programs for the um, YMCA of Greater Richmond. Um, but I am excited to welcome Deb and Stephanie from the health department to walk through some information regarding the vaccine, just to give you some information, some facts about um, the vaccine to make decisions for your own personal um, use. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to them. We are gonna ask everybody, if you're not already, to please mute your line so that way we have a spirit of learning. But the chat box is open and ready for your questions. And we'll also have some time at the end of the conversation. So with that, I'll turn it over to my friends at the health department. Thank you so much, Jana. I am Deb Zimmerman. I have been a nurse leader in Virginia now for 11 years and part of the COVID preparation, response, reactivation, and now part of the immunization practice. Joining me tonight is an extraordinary nursing leader who has 20 years of experience, uh, and that is Stephanie Tony. And also we have joining us today, someone new to our team, Stephanie Flowers. So you have three of us and we will do our best Debbie well, accidentally hit uh, mute. But that was such a kind introduction um, as Deb is coming off mute. Oh, I felt so warm inside. That's so lovely. Thank you. I may have to pick up if you're still having trouble um, coming off mute. No? Okay. All right, um, so I will go ahead and, and pick it up. I am definitely joined, I think the, I don't know if she mentioned um, Stephanie Flowers name, um, but Stephanie Flowers is also joining us from the health department. And so um, as she was saying, we will definitely do our best to answer your questions and provide you with reliable information. It is updating all the time. Um, as we speak, information is being updated somewhere on the um, internet or at the CDC or at our um, BDH health department. So um, just know that as we go through these slides, we are uh, giving you the most up-to-date information that we have, but things do change and evolve. All right, Deb, I think I see you. I can hear you maybe. Yes, you can. Thank you. I'm not sure I didn't touch anything, so I don't know what happened. So I apologize. So anyway, um, we are back to talk to you as Stephanie said about the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, which we are absolutely delighted is now here in Virginia. There are many vaccines that are currently under development. Four vaccines have been approved for use worldwide, but only two are currently approved and available to us right here in Virginia. That both vaccines um, I'll talk to you tonight about. One is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the other is the Moderna vaccine. Both of these vaccines work very similarly. If you look at the column on the left that it talks about the DNA and RNA, both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine work in the same way. It, um, in a lab, a protein is manufactured. It then is formulated into a vaccine, injected into your arm, and then your body then responds by creating antibodies so that when you are exposed or if you are exposed to the coronavirus, your body will be able to respond and ward off the disease so you will not get sick with coronavirus. This is a relatively new, a new type of vaccine, and we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. On the last column over to your right, what you'll see is the viral vector, and that's the more traditional way that a, a vaccine is manufactured. What they take is a non-infectious, um, usually a little type of cold virus, and then they um, formulate that into a vaccine. You then, um, are, I get an injection and then you, um, you develop antibodies the exact same way. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine 
and the AstraZeneca vaccine are manufactured using this um, tried and true technology. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine just went for FDA approval a couple of weeks ago. We expect that next week it will be approved for emergency use and available for us here in Virginia in March. The beauty of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it does not need to be refrigerated and it also um, is only requiring one vaccine. So that's the good news about uh, upcoming vaccines. With any of the vaccines, whether it be the old, you know, the Johnson and Johnson and the AstraZeneca or the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, you absolutely cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine. People sometimes believe that they can because your body, after it receives the vaccine, has um, it, it developed is developing antibodies, so you get that soreness, sometimes muscle aches. And you think then that you've caught COVID-19, but you actually have not caught, caught the illness. What it is is your body's responding to the vaccine in, and developing those antibodies. So that's actually really a good sign. If we talk for just a few minutes about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, they're very similar. Like I said, the Pfizer vaccine though is typically given in large health systems because it needs to be kept at a very, very cold temperature. And um, that usually is, um, yeah, you know, only um, something that large academic medical centers or hospitals have. So, in general, the um, the healthcare workers are typically getting Pfizer, but that's not all the it, that, that's not um, completely true. We know that at some of our events here, sponsored by the Department of Health, we've been able to give the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna vaccine is actually stored at almost just a normal freezer temperature, so it's a little a bit easier to um, manage that vaccine and then administer at, uh, at um, health types, a large health kinds of events. Both of these vaccines require you to get two doses. The Pfizer vaccine, you get your initial dose and then three weeks or 21 days later, you get your second vaccine. The Moderna vaccine is actually given 28 days or four weeks later. So you get one and then 28 days later, you get your second vaccine. It is important if you start with the Pfizer vaccine, you complete with the Pfizer vaccine. And if you start with the Moderna vaccine, you complete with the Moderna vaccine. There's been a whole lot of talk, and you probably heard it on the news, about how quickly this vaccine was manufactured. Well, the science behind this vaccine actually began 10 to 15 years ago. It began with the SARS outbreak and the MERS outbreak that occurred in Canada and parts of the United States. And the coronavirus itself is very similar to the SARS and MERS virus. So they have been working on this research for many years, but the federal government gave $4.5 billion to speed up that research and the testing of the vaccine, which allowed it to uh, be manufactured. In addition to that, the vaccine has gone through three trials or three phases of trials. All vaccines go through these trials and no shortcuts were taken in order to um, manufacture and test this vaccine. Because COVID um, had so many volunteers, over 70,000 volunteers um, set, raised their hand and said they would participate in the study. We were able to have more participants and that sped up some of the studies and allowed some of the studies to take place at the same time. But no uh, shortcuts were taken. All of the same safeguards that are put into any vaccine were put into, into the vaccines that are currently now available. Um, like I said, over 70,000 people participated in the study. And because we saw that COVID-19 was hitting um, uh, populations of color, there, they have um, been, a, it, those populations have been tested with the vaccine. Also, those who have chronic illnesses such as diabetes, asthma, heart disease, and seniors were also tested. This was not tested in the pediatric population. The Moderna vaccine uh, did their testing in 18 and above. The Pfizer vaccine was age 16 and above. 
We are currently now doing testing in that pediatric population. Same thing with pregnant women. Pregnant women did not participate in the initial studies, but the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology often does recommend that pregnant women receive this vaccine because it is so safe. And they also recommend it for their lactating patients or breastfeeding moms because it dissipates and is not in breast milk. We do recommend though that any woman who is planning on getting pregnant or pregnant, check with their obstetrician before getting the vaccine just to make sure um, you uh, double check before moving forward. The good news with this vaccine is that very, very effective, 95% effective when most vaccines are only 60 to 70% effective. This is truly an amazing feat with both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. This is Dr. Rob Wynn. I have had the privilege of working with him. He is head of the Massey Cancer Center and his passion is equity in care. And in his message, and you, can, um, you will have these slides and you can actually hear his YouTube video. What he wants you to know is that no matter what vaccine is available, you should take advantage of it. He specifically mentions in this video, the Johnson & Johnson video, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. You may hear that it is upwards of 72% effective, but in the scheme of things, the FDA approved it and it is an incredibly effective vaccine and only requires one dose. So if that vaccine is offered to you, Dr. Wynn is saying, please don't turn away and wait for the Moderna or the Pfizer. Take advantage of this vaccine because it's really just as, just as good a vaccine. Is the vaccine safe? Fortunately, the, the, we have uh, been able to have the 70,000 who've been in the initial studies and we've been watching them very closely. And then we've been able, there have been almost, I think, um, three or 4 million people who've actually received the vaccine and we are monitoring side effects. So if you have the vaccine and you're worried, you can actually, um, these are, um, these are, you can, um, apps on your phone that you can put and you can even um, log on to it and even put your uh, side effects from the vaccine. But thus far, this is an incredibly safe vaccine. The only contraindication um, or, and it's not necessarily even a contraindication, but if you have had a problem with an injectable vaccine in your past, such as having the need to use an EpiPen or have had shortness of breath or required you to go to the emergency department, then you should check first with either your allergist or your primary care physician prior to getting the vaccine. If you're worried about the vaccine, you should also, when you're, the nurse is giving you the vaccine, you should tell the nurse that you're worried. And what we ask is for all people who receive the vaccine to wait 15 minutes just to make sure you have no serious side effects. But um, if you're worried, we ask you to stay an additional 15 minutes and actually wait for 30 minutes before moving on. And they're very happy to answer any of your questions. The good news is um, that this is a very safe vaccine and with very, very few side effects. Whoops. Well, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> These, the what can you expect? The um, soreness at the site, fever, chills, fatigue, joint pain, muscle pain, and headaches. These really are the same side effects that you receive with any vaccine. Some people have said that after the second vaccine, because they have some antibodies, in fact, 85% um, effectiveness after the first dose, which is really great. So you may have more significant side effects after your second vaccine. Usually they resolve within 24, most 48 hours, but they are typical of what you would see with a flu vaccine or any other vaccine, maybe just a little bit um, more with that second vaccine. Who gets the vaccine and how is that decided? The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, um, they are part of the CDC. They actually look at what's going on with the disease. And then based on that, they develop 
categories um, so that they can preserve the health and wellness of the, of the country um, and reduce the spread and also look at what populations are impacted um, most significantly from the disease uh, that the vaccine is uh, preventing. So what we have, you've heard about those different phases. We have com our largely completed phase 1A. Phase 1A is our healthcare workers, since they are caring for COVID positive patients, we immunize them first. We also saw that people, uh, the elderly and those living in congregate settings were significantly impacted. So they too were also part of the first phase of vaccine uh, recipients. We've now moved into phase 1B. Phase 1B is our frontline essential workers. They are our police, our EMT, our hazmats, those working in prisons, also our prisoners and others that are firefighters, childcare workers, our pre-K workers and our teachers are who we are immunizing now. In phase 1B, um, we um, have immunized 75 years and above, and we are working our way to those that are 65 and above. We believe that we, it is going to still take a couple of months for us to complete phase 1B to when we um, then move on to 1C and the other phases for vaccine. Vax uh, Virginia has been allotted 1,621,975 vaccines to date. That was as of February 12th. We have uh, received 28,000 or a little bit more than that. We've received, and the minute we receive it, we give out those doses. So um, sometimes it takes 24 hours, but the, our goal is when we receive it to get that vaccine immediately to you and get them in arms, which is really um, very a very good and high rate to have a 93% rate of uh, administration. How can you um, get more information about the vaccine. You can go to vaxrichmond.com. It's vax.rchd.com. And on that website, there will be a link where you can register or you can even check to make sure that you are registered. Once you register, we went to a statewide uh, registration system this week. You will get a text if you have a cell phone or an email that you um, that you are part of the system. And if you want to check, you can go back on the link. And there's actually another little link you can link on if you go to the VaxRichmond.com website. And um, they will say, "Yep, you're here." And they do plan on giving you regular feedback. Also, we know that for some people, it's been difficult to register. They don't have access to email. So as of uh, today, they have set up a, a telephone number. It's a statewide telephone number so that you can actually um, speak to someone and they will help you with that registration process. If you call the call center below, 877-829-4682, um, that is the statewide number. Um, when I called it a little while ago to test it out, because today was the first day that it was in use, there was a bit of a wait, but so have patience if you wanna use that call center. It is important uh, for us to continue even with immunization to use our best practices of masking, washing hands, and also social distancing. How can you learn more about the vaccine? There is a lot of misinformation and it is important if you have people who are calling you, there are a bunch of scams and even uh, we hear about some of them locally. If someone is calling you and asking you for money to register, please do not take it. You, uh, registration and uh, receiving the vaccine is for free. When you go to websites, go to reliable sources for information. Go to the Virginia Department of Health, go for, to the Centers of Disease Control, NPR, which is uh, National Public Broadcasting. The VCU has been conducting a great deal of research related to the vaccine. New York Times and also our local county health districts also have good information. Go to a reliable source if you need to learn more about the, um, about the vaccine. 
Why should I get the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, it's effective. It really does work. It's safe that, um, and it's important. It's free and it really takes every single one of us to end the pandemic. The sooner we're all um, able to get vaccinated, the sooner we can, um, we can all go back to a life that we long remember of hugging and shaking hands and uh, being in groups. The rest of us need all of us to really be as healthy as possible and to really participate in this. It really is something that takes all of us. And without further ado, we're going to now open it up to uh, questions. And uh, these are the references. Um, you can go to these sites, and we're going to make this slide presentation available to you. So uh, don't hesitate to, um, to, to go to any of these sites. They have Many of them have uh, questions and answers in English, not in medical languages that are sometimes difficult to understand. But they also um, take you through many other uh, answers to questions that we may not cover tonight. So without further ado, I think um, don't hesitate to ask, answer, ask questions. And I don't know uh, if there's anything, Stephanie, that you're seeing in the chat room. Yeah, so I do have a, um, a couple of questions that have come in through the chat, excuse me, through the chat. Um, I would just like to reiterate that I did put the link to vax.rchd.com in the chat box. And that will, that's our website. Um, and we will update that with new information and it will redirect you to, if you're signing up as a, or pre-registering as an individual, you would be able to use that site vax.rchd.com to see that question, registering as an individual, you can click that and it will take you to our state um, pre-registration site. As well as if you're registering on behalf of an organization, if you're in the HR department and you're trying to help uh, the uh, workforce of, as a, a frontline essential personnel in order to get the vaccine or register the organization to receive the vaccine, um, there's a spot on our website to also do that. Um, so the reason we're encouraging you to still go to vax.rct.com is to find the organization's um, site to register an organization as well as the site for um, personal registration or if you're registering on behalf of, of someone that you know. Um, and so one of the questions that we have in the chat is, I am 75 and I have been pre-registered for several weeks. Will I have at least been contacted for a shot before the priority list is opened up to 1C? So the answer to that is yes. Um, when you registered, you were actually put into a category. And we are sorry that, um, you know, it's, uh, we have not had the sufficient number of vaccine that to immunize you. You can um, certainly call that call center too um, to ask and inquire, but um, what, what they, or if you even want to check on your registration, you can go to the website and there's a little thing and you put in your name and then you can check to make sure your registration is there. If your registration is there, they are going to call you. So don't worry. And then the next question is on average, how long does it take to get a call if you're in the identified group? Well, that's a good question, isn't it, Stephanie? It is. Well, we, you know, I just heard the governor today say, you know, we need, um, in order for us, you know, to really vaccinate uh, Virginia, we need 300,000 doses a week, and we are getting about 120,000 doses a week for the entire Commonwealth. He is a great advocate, and he is incredibly vocal. So it, I wish we could give timelines, um, but what we do now have is a statewide um, system, you don't have to go to your, you, you know, so because of that, you can just check to make sure you're registered and you're, you're there. Um, I didn't mention the CVS. CVS is not linked to the, um, to the Department of Health website. They actually have their own separate website. CVS um, has um, engaged in a, in a federal, um, 
allotment system. So uh, the federal government has contracted with the big pharmacies throughout the United States and in the Commonwealth of Virginia and in Central Virginia, that is CVS. So because of that, there will be um, some vaccine coming to CVS. Um, and they, their system at the current time, the governor even spoke about that today, does not link. So what you can do is you can sign up if it's available. Sometimes it closes out. Um, usually it's open once a week, the CVS system. I, I've heard it opens on Tuesday at around 5.15 a.m. Um, you can register there um, and that system, uh, you know, it, they're abiding by the same rules, but if it gets, if they notify you of availability quicker than us, then go ahead and take that vaccine. Um, okay. There are, uh, there's another question here. Um, is it typical for someone's arm to stay sore for over two weeks from the shot? Um, however, my arm has been sore for at least two weeks now. So typically the, um, the, the symptoms resolve within 48 hours. There are times though, um, and th th that, uh, that, that it has been, um, you know, a week to two weeks, but if it lasts longer, I would say you're at the, uh, the upper limit. I would go ahead and give your primary doctor a call just to make sure that there isn't, it, it isn't anything else more serious. But I think um, it, this is still probably part of um, the side effect, but any longer, I'd give your doctor a call. Stephanie, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, so I got the vaccine about two weeks ago now, it's today. Yeah, about two weeks ago. And my arm is not necessarily sore. I could tell that I had a vaccine, right? But it's, I don't know how to describe it. And I'm not trying to say that I know exactly what you're feeling because um, every person is different. So I would definitely defer um, with uh, Deb's recommendation to follow up with your PCP if you have concerns. Um, everybody responds a little bit differently. And like when you register through vSafe at the CDC's website, it will allow you to provide that feedback. So then as we get more information of millions of people saying my arm was sore for two weeks afterwards, the um, mild uh, temporary side effects list would increase when it says soreness at the injection site, you know, the CDC may update it to say for two to three weeks after receiving the injection. So your feedback is welcome. Um, and so following with your primary care doctor for your own situation, as well as registering to the vSafe website, even after you've received the vaccine, um, you can still it like ask you when you got the vaccine. So it knows how often to follow up with you. When you first received the vaccine, it, um, texts you a link to provide your feedback um, every day for seven days um, and then every other day and then once a week and then you know every other week and every month so on and so forth for a year for you to continue to provide feedback about how you're feeling so I invite you to still register at be safe um, to be able to provide your feedback there as well as following up with your primary care doctor you're welcome <laughs> Any other questions? I know another um, frequently asked question that we get is, uh, is the vaccine required annually? And at this time that hasn't been identified as something that's gonna be needed as more time passes and you know they evaluate the results or continued efficacy for those that have received the vaccine, then that information will become available. At, but at this time, it's not looking like it's gonna need to be an annual booster or annual vaccine like the flu shot. Any other questions that you uh, frequently remember us getting, Deb, that you would just put out as an answer that we may not have covered? There were um, concerns that um, people, um, it, you know, it might affect fertility and we have not seen anything related to that either. Um, uh, in fact, I did see something in one of the medical journals that said that question comes up with almost every vaccine, but um, that has not been an issue here with this vaccine as, as well. Another question in the chat, what age is appropriate for children to get the shot? So the um, Pfizer vaccine, it is 16 years and above, but right now um, the American uh, College of Pediatricians um, have, you know, have, are not recommending this vaccine 
For children, there might be a rare instance if they have comorbid conditions or you know other other factors where they want them to get the vaccine. But the vaccine was not tested um, in children. Those studies are just now underway. So we'll see probably in the upcoming months to a year. And that's pretty typical. The flu vaccine, when the flu vaccine first came out, that was just for adults. And then they expanded the recommendations to be all age groups. A question of, can you repeat the information about the CVS registration information? So um, I don't have the specific recommendations. I would recommend that you go to the CVS website um, I do know in the CVS that is in my neighborhood, they actually have a big sign and says, we do not have any, any vaccine right now. So I just know that it is coming. Um, and that we've received lots of questions in some of these town halls about the uh, vaccine. Um, so um, I'm just gonna mention one other thing we mentioned on one of the slides, but didn't really go into in detail. It is gonna be helpful to get an email address, even though there may be some technology barriers to like accessing checking email frequently, you can um, let someone help you create an email address, um, as well as following up with your primary care doctor about your own underlying conditions to be able to like get some reassurance for yourself and your situation, um, as well as following up with your local pharmacy as well. So uh, while CVS is uh, something that's been named and been publicized, uh, there may be other local health departments that are planning to do the same to be able to um, offer the vaccine as well. So you could be looking into that as well. Um, I see one question that says, is the notification email or a call labeled spam? So um, I forget what the email said. The text came back because um, I actually tested myself and I'm just reading it off of my cell phone. And it came back with a telephone number and it says your pre-registration was successful and then gave me a reference number. So you do get a reference number in your text. And I don't remember what the email said, but it was a very similar kind of email that you get because um, you put your email in that information that you provide along with your address and telephone number. I will say in reference to uh, schemes that are out there um, that may be trying to you know, exploit people desiring to receive the vaccine, we will never ask for your social security number, your banking information. You're not required to be a citizen in order to receive the vaccine. So if anybody is like pushing at that issue, like give me your banking information or else you're not getting this vaccine, that is not us. Um, if they're asking for your social security number, that's not us either. We, we ask demographic information to identify the, the community that we're serving. Um, and so that information we will ask, but we won't ask for your social security number, which would tie into you being a citizen, right? Um, or banking information. So two things where we would not ask for that information. Um, and then if you have questions, like if something doesn't feel right, usually go with your gut and then just follow up. Instead of just responding to what they've sent, you should only get something when they're reaching, uh, you've reached out to them um, as well. Um, mm -hmm. So you could always say, can I have your phone number and give you a call back so you know you're calling back to the organization. There's different ways to safeguard yourself from being um, caught up in a scheme. Right, and um, when people initially registered, they didn't get a reference number. That is with the new system that they get a reference number, but your information, if you registered previously, was uploaded to the new system. And what you can do is you can actually go into the system, go online, um, and you can go through the richmond.com or another way you can go directly, it's vaccinate.virginia.gov. So you write out the word vaccinate.virginia.gov and it has the same system. And then you just say, you wanna check your registration. There's a little tab for it. And then um, that'll tell you if you're registered or not. So no worries. I think I can just go to that website briefly and show you all, since it's a fairly new system and we have a little bit of time here, um, I think it would be helpful yeah. for us to just review that briefly. Um, so I went to vax.rchd.com. I just wanted to show you this site and then um, let me just share my screen again so that you all can see what I see. 
And like um, Deb mentioned, uh, Dr. Wynn's video is in our slideshow presentation and we'll show you the link for that. Let me close these other things so you can see the, the full screen here. Um, so I went to vax.rchd.com and that rerouted me to this website. If you're an organization, you're going to click on for or an organization. If you're for an individual, you can click here and this will take you directly into the um, system the statewide pre-registration system, and you can fill in your information. And uh, when you hit next, that will fill in there. If you're already pre-registered, it would um, you know, let you know that you're already registered as well. So you can check the list. So mm -hmm. this is the registration page. And then if you check the list, this is how this page will look to actually search for um, by your email or by your phone number. I am actually not in this because I've already gotten my um, my vaccine, but you would just fill in the information that you have available to you. And at the bottom of the screen, it would say you you are pre-registered uh, or you the user yeah, is registered yeah. is the way yeah, it reads. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The user is registered. So it would just show up on this screen and say that you're already registered. Yep. And then if you actually need to register for the first time, because you have never done any type of interest form or pre-registration form in the past for where you live, you would actually click on this to actually pre-register and complete all of this information here. Um, it will go through and ask you some additional questions as well to identify which uh, phase you're in. So if you answer it and the way you've answered the questions, you are already a part of a healthcare provider, right? And you are eligible to receive the vaccine since uh, that is a part of 1A, they would um, notify you that you're eligible to receive the vaccine now and they'd go forward with uh, connecting you to get to a vaccination event, getting an appointment to get to the vaccination event. Um, so they'll have some additional questions after this screen as well for you to fill in to um, identify uh, where you are within the uh, phase process of us distributing the vaccine. So someone asked that they were, they, um, whoops, lost the chat there. Oh, sorry about that. I closed the screen because I thought it'd be uh, easier to, yeah. uh, if somebody okay. asked me to go someplace no, else. I got it. So okay. it says, I was told you could receive the vaccine at the Richmond racetrack. Is that one of the locations to the health department or is that a separate sign up? So go ahead and answer that, Steph. Yeah, so the pre-registration is the way to go. So we wanna make sure that we're funneling everyone to the same website instead of having anyone show up at any location. And there is a long line because people aren't pre-registered. So for the purposes of this uh, recording, I probably won't um, confirm that information. And I would just say that it is wise for you to pre-register at the, at the website you can go to vax.rcg.com and get to the right place, or you can just go to um, Vaccinate Virginia website as well if you wanted a more direct route to get to that. And that is how you would uh, pre-register to receive the vaccine. Based so, on how you respond to the answers, they'll let you know how you can register to receive the vaccine. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah, I was just gonna say, but the Department of Health has in the past sponsored um big events at the raceway so but people did not need to register in a different format they just registered through the department of health website and then they were told to actually go to that location for their vaccine right something like that i think it depends on in what route they came in so sometimes it was here's your appointment go to this location with this paper filled in versus actually registering on a website so it could have come in different formats depending on um, how you registered because that's a more of a regional approach and every health department has a little bit of a different nuance in how they uh, register uh, for those larger regional events. Mm -hmm. In the past, let me say that, we're coming to a more centralized way of doing things. So um, pre-registering on the website is the way to go. Mm -hmm. All right, in the link, I've put the direct link to the pre-registration page um, as well, if you just wanted to click it. Um, I know sometimes uh, trying to memorize a website is, is kind of hard, but you will get these slides at the end of this presentation, and uh, we appreciate you. We turn it back over to you, Jana. Yeah, thanks, ladies. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. We appreciate it. 
Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we will send out a recording of this um, probably in five to seven days once we get it uploaded to the YMCA's YouTube channel. Um, but we will send it to the email address that you registered with or through, um, in addition to the slide decks you have all of the links. Um, and then I just want to invite you, We the YMCA does have additional um, conversations coming up working with the health department. We just booked another six, I think, um, for the coming month of March um, and into April. In addition to English sessions, we also have a few Spanish sessions um, that are available too. So that will also be included in the follow-up email that you can share. Um, if you found this information beneficial, we would encourage you to share that with your family and your friends, your colleagues. You do not have to be a YMCA member um, to participate. We're just trying to help people understand and learn about the vaccine so they can make decisions for themselves. So with, also, if it's okay yep. with you, um, like to invite um, Helen to come off mute as yeah. she has some more information about other uh, town halls that we're gonna be hosting in other languages. Um, okay. I can't, I don't have the list. I think Dari is this weekend or maybe Swahili is this Friday. Um, but Helen, if you're still on the line and can come off mute, we would invite you to share that information with us. Sure, yeah, I'm pulling up that email. I, I know we've got like five languages scheduled. We do, we've got several. Um, so we'll probably, if you don't have it in front of you, it's okay, I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, but when we send out the information with the links, we will, or with this presentation, we will be sure to have that information in there as well for any upcoming and additional languages as well. Yeah, and we're reestablished Richmond and we're trying to make it really accessible to everybody. So we'll just have it live on our Facebook page. So if you just search reestablished Richmond on Facebook, they'll have um, regular postings of all of the flyers too. But yes, this week is Dari um, and it is at 5.30 p.m. Thank you so much. Sorry, Jana, continue. No, that's it. Thank you, everybody. We'll send you out um, the dates and the times, the links and languages. Um, so that way you can share with family, friends, colleagues. Um, but with that, thanks, Stephanie and Deb. And everyone have a great evening. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Yeah.